is a lifelong member of staff of Scottish Agronomy. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives me great pride and it's humbling to be asked and I appreciate SOS asking me to speak. I'm also slightly nervous for a reason. There's a fair few hungry looking faces in this audience. It's getting near lunchtime and I'm one of the reasons it's keeping me from near lunch. So I will try and be brief. Why, why Scottish agronomy? Well, I hate to delve into new speaking. For years I said I would never work for an organisation that had a uh, mission statement, I loathe these things, but this actually sums up what we do. We are a solutions organisation and we are here to bridge the gap between higher science institutes and what growers can actually do on farm. Which actually puts us under a fair bit of pressure at the moment because it's a, it's a quickly changing environment that we find ourselves living in and an awful lot of the conversations around sustainability talk about the challenges, but precious few of them talk about solutions. And our membership are looking at us to provide those solutions. So, largely the guts of this presentation will be where, where we are and what we are looking at currently by way of potential solutions. Note the use of the word potential, very important word to you. But, but also, it's a, you know, why are we here and what are the challenges? So, if you'll allow me, we'll start with the challenges, but just a, a little bit of context of, a, you know, why we're in this position. And it's simply this, we have the largest arable research programme in Northern UK. A, we're the largest feeder into recommended list, national list, commercial trials, uh, in Northern UK. It gives us an awful lot of firepower to actually try out what's been suggested and make sure it works. And I think this is something that we all have to bear in mind. Whichever route this journey takes us on, science has to be at the heart of it, and that science has to be tested on farm. There is a, we're under a lot of pressure, time pressure, to get this right and to move quickly, and there is a real danger that growers are forced to move at a rate that the signs can't keep up with. And if that's the case, we could have some problems <coughs> on our hands. I'll give you one potential example. The one thing I want to point out, as an organisation, I've been with Scottish Agronomy since 1989. I know I, I don't look old enough. I used to have hair down to my shoulders when I started, which is a, a dim and distant memory. In that time, we haven't sold one pea of seed, one litre of chemical, or one kilo of fertiliser. All Scottish Agronomy provides, and it's the way of member services, is advice and trial services. It's very important for the things I'm going to be discussing. So, sustainability. Definitions are really important, but really divisive. You know, and I'm deliberately trying to stay away from buzzwords because they allow such passion. You know, any presentation that you you mentioned regenerative agriculture, you immediately split a room into camps. I think we've got to get away from that. We've got to get away from labels <laughs> simply because people make up their mind before they've actually gone any further. This all has to be about solutions and what we can actually do on a practical level. So let's stay away from labels. Let's just work on the basis that the three things that have to come out of this are people, planet, and profits. Now, often profit is a dirty word. Now, I'm not going to talk about this slide at any great uh, level of detail. It's simply a background. If growers aren't making a margin, they're not sustainable. It's that simple. So whichever way we go, profitability has to be retained because if you're not making a profit, you're not sustainable. You know, yes, there is a moral imperative to change and improve our environmental <coughs> profile, but if you're not in business, you can't do that. So first and foremost, it's our responsibility to remember this, because no profit, no sustainability. And I mean, <coughs> you've got to put this in the context of the change that the industry's been facing. You know, we've all heard We've all experienced 
uh, what's been happening with fertiliser prices in the recent past. The reality is the difference between November 2020 and November last year, it takes three times as much wheat to pay for a ton of or to pay for the nitrogen used to produce it. That's the context. If you want to drive change, that's a pretty good and solid driver of change. Again, I'm sullying myself by talking financials, but you know, if you want to drive the uh, growers towards change, there's a pretty strong incentive. You know, the fact is, if this graph keeps going that way, we're not going to be able to afford, and we're going to have to uh, get fertility in the rotation using other methods. And this ties in nightly, uh, nicely with the challenge of bottom fertility on farm. Because if you look at the overall level of greenhouse grass, gas emissions on farm in an arable setting, the vast majority of it either comes directly from bottom fertiliser or from its use. So there is a challenge and a possible benefit. However, I may be about to set the cat amongst the pigeons, but I'm about to slay some dragons. Reducing nitrogen levels in itself is not a means to reduce the CO2 output from a crop. I won't go into details here, but basically using AgriCalc here, that a, a well-grown crop of wheat producing a good yield, we members who can do much better than that, <coughs> its CO2 output is more efficient than a moderate, moderate input producing a lower yield. You know, it's not a case we fixed these figures. We decided beforehand these were the crops we were going to look at and these are yields taken from our trials and we put these figures through AgriCalc. Okay? So, let's slate the dragon that nitrogen use is bad. It's efficient nitrogen use is the key to arable production. You know, it, to manage yield is where we need to be. There is a moral responsibility on all arable growers to make the most of the arable land that we have available. There's 8 billion mouths in this planet to feed now. You know, if we can't produce it from the land that we're already using, then more marginal land is going to have to be brought into production <coughs> simply to feed the world. And if that means more deforestation in Amazonia, then that is definitely not the answer. As a trialist for 30 odd years, I'm sorry, you, you must apologise for the next three slides, but I get so excited about an experiment that's run, been running for 167 years. God, that is, you know, I could only dream of this as trials manager in the Scottish economy. But there's really important messages out of these projects. And, you know, as a, as a nation, we are so lucky that uh, our four, forefathers had the foresight to set projects like this up and then keep them going. The difficulty is not setting them up, the difficulty is keeping them going. Wilderness levels of carbon, 100%, 3.1% soil organic carbon. Over that time, if you only grew wheat with no inputs, you're reduced to 31%. If you used some form of fertiliser, you're at 38% of that wilderness level. If you applied 35 tonnes of FYM and that's a chunky amount of F FYM. I'm not convinced that would ever be practical. Now, I feel sorry for the poor sods that uh, used the barrow in a great 167 years ago to apply it. But even at that, you still have a marginal reduction. A 59-year experiment, disappointingly short, but uh, it, 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 it'll do. An arable rotation is at 45%. Putting grass in that rotation, 62%. That's getting better. Continuous grass, 92%. If we till the land, we reduce the carbon content of that. A more recent experience, a mere 22 years, removal of straw, chopping straw, 
For many people, this is an answer to increase in carbon levels. 22 years continuous chop straw only raised the soil organic carbon by 3%. It's very important that we know what the benefit is from our actions. Importing three times as much straw as the crop produced only put it up 10%. There is a limit to what we can do in an arable setting if we want to maintain production from that land. It's that simple. So why not use that land to produce as efficiently as possible to make sure that less productive land isn't forced into production. There's massive pressure for change. You cannot open the press without, you know, another headline and presenting it as answers, as a panacea. I, regardless, we, everyone in this room will have different opinions every time they read one of these articles. The real pressure comes from this little bit here. The end users expect change. When you have the Pepsicos and the Diageos of this world saying that within a period of time, for Pepsico it happens to be by 2030, that they want to source their raw material from sustainably produced crop, then we have no choice. We have to take this on board. So, it is a changing age, but for years, We've talked about integrated pest management. When I sat basis many years ago, I was surprised when my certificate arrived and it said I'd also passed the IPM module. If you'd asked me at that time what IPM was, I couldn't actually have told you. That, that is the level of lip service we were paying to it as a subject. Because for many years, arable producers were gods. Because we chose a variety, we went to a spray store, and the answer to 95% of our problems came from one or the other. That is no longer the case. And as the managing director of an agronomy company, it is difficult to go to growers now and say, we don't have a solution to this problem. But that is the reality of the situation we find ourselves in. So all these uh, different routes are now part of this solution. We are no longer gods, we are mere mortals, and it's a combination of these factors that uh, we're going to have to look to in the future. So, as an organisation, what are Scottish Agronomy doing about it? First of all, we're offering different services to our members. We've sullied, sullied our hands with carbon auditing. We are, uh, we've instigated business groups within our members and we're looking to bolt on uh, carbon measurement onto that. This has been very much driven by member demand. But it's very important that we don't forget the basics as well. And the basics of what Scottish Agronomy does is screen varieties for suitability within Scotland. And what isn't often shouted about from the rooftops is this is actually a success story. In the last 30 years, on-farm spring barley yields have risen by two tonnes a hectare. That basically represents a 30% increase from the same level of inputs. It's not that we've increased our input levels by 30%. We've probably reduced our chemical spend and at best kept our uh, nitrogen use at similar levels, but our output is 30%. Key to everything we do in an arable situation going forward will still revolve around variety choice and screening varieties that are suitable for our needs. But, we're an agronomy company, we, uh, we have a need to provide solutions and there's new challenges and that's going to require new solutions. So we can't get away from the fact growing crops is an energy calculation, it's energy in, energy out, and we cannot escape that. But what we need to do is look at energy in with a much more environmentally friendly profile. Calcium ammonium nitrate, you've got Nigel Davies comments on it there. Uh, it's certainly greener than ammonium nitrate. I don't personally think it's the answer, but it's a gateway drug to a, you know, a, a friendlier profile. And you now have certain contracts that stipulate the use of a lower carbon 
a form of fertiliser in the crops. I've got to say, of all the projects we're involved in, this is one of the most exciting. CCM, I don't know how many of you have heard of it. Uh, I knew I would forget what CCM stands for. Carbon capture, blah, excuse me, it's gone. Manufacturing. I don't know if it is manufacturing, but is it? Thank you. A potato byproduct, waste product. At the moment, uh, not a lot done with it. Turned into pellets. And uh, how can I describe it? They, they basically look like calf feed. And you definitely don't want to be walking down the field behind the spreader. It will spread to 36 metres, but if you're within range, it'll take an eye out. It is bloody lethal. <laughs> but the environmental profile of this product, product is far better. It's, a, it's analysis 1244. The issue is at the moment, 6%, the 6 of that nitrogen is actually having to be imported from either uh, urea or nitrate. However, they're looking at green sources of production rather than buying and imported. We, we trialled this product last year. The best I can say about it, in a direct comparison with CAN, with ammonium nitrate, with urea, we couldn't tell the difference. Unfortunately, all our fertiliser stores are going to have to get a lot bigger. If that's only a 12% concentration, you need at least three or four times as much of it per hectare as you would. But as a potential solution, this has got legs. One of the joys of research is it doesn't always work out. We often go down blind alleys. And I very deliberately put this in here because at one point this was being touted as a potential answer to all our problems. A product that could be applied to any crop it was claimed and turn it into a leguminous crop with the ability to fix its own nitrogen. And the best thing was it worked absolutely perfectly in the glass house. You know, so we could potentially, with the use of this product, reduce our imported nitrogen by, the, the initial claim was 50%. There was only one problem. In three years of trials, there was actually that, it was, there was longer than that, but say three years of trials, we never once got it to work in the field. You know, this is the holy grail, the ability to produce our own nitrogen through the crops that we grow. But we've got to face the reality, and it's why we do research, that it's only performance in the field that will tell us if it works. And if it doesn't work, it takes us on a, it takes us down a rabbit hole that there may not be any way back from. So that, I'm blowing the trumpet for research here, but it's very important that the claims of manufacturers are put to the test. The real challenge we have in Scotland within an arable setting is actually the limited crops that we can grow. And if we could grow pulses in the rotation, all of a sudden the fertility issues look a little bit easier. You know, in, as someone who is scarred from trying to harvest peas and beans in Scotland at ridiculous times a year waiting for a frost to travel, uh, I'm only too well aware of the pitfalls of these crops. One of our members started experimenting a number of years ago. Now, admittedly, this member is situated on the Fife Riviera, so he does have uh, the climate on his side. Spring bean types sown in the autumn. Test areas, not quite a hectare. That's the yields he produced last year. These are incredibly, incredibly promising yields. But, as I mentioned, it's the Fife Riviera. The weather's quite kind there. We have a, a pilot group. We are trying this as a solution at five geographically spread locations around the country from the borders to north of the Black Isle. Uh, it's quite a good winter to test them out and see if they make it through the winter. But if we can grow beans and harvest them in August or the beginning of September, that would be a major step forward in what we can do in an arable situation. It's also a good source of homegrown protein as well. <laughs> Cover crops. You cannot open a magazine 
a, at the moment without someone championing the use of cover crops. And you know something, quite rightly, it, uh, it provides us a, a whole new set of options from what we can do in an arable setting. You know, is it retaining fertility, improving uh, structure as a habitat, or is a non-chemical means of control? We've had much success controlling uh, free-living nematodes with the use of oil radish. There are pitfalls, unintended consequences. Brassicas included in a cover crop can encourage club root, which can have serious effects on your uh, following rotations. Phacelia, ironically, can increase free-living nematodes. We are great believers and we are actually putting more resources and organisation into how we manage and how we use cover crops. The important message is pretty simple. Treat them as a crop. You know, don't take the snake oil salesman's uh, word on what it will do. Decide what you want out of that cover crop and plan accordingly and use it accordingly. Grow it as a crop. One of the, this was actually just taken last week when the frost was in the ground, one of the things we're actually doing this year is simply screening these mixes to see what makes it through the winter, to find out, you know, that if, if we know what can be winter sown and what can be spring sown, that opens up a great deal of possibilities to our, member about, our members about when and where they can use cover crops. As an organisation, we've been heavily involved in promoting rye as a crop. Now, rye is a, a bit of a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned because basically with oat input you get wheat output. It uses 25% less water to produce a tonne of grain as compared to wheat. Higher output at lower nitrogen levels. You know, it's a, if we want to maintain output but reduce input, rye is a potential answer. There are, like everything else, there's a law of unintended consequences, and they've got risk is very real, but there are ways of avoiding it. But we've got to look at alternative crops. We've got to look at alternative ways of managing our land. Should all the land that we're using for arable production continue to be used of it? Every arable grower will tell you about areas of this farm that never perform, you know, it's a wet hole or below trees or, you know, it's just off the pace, it's that bit of land that just never does. Well, but every year that land is put back into production. With yield mapping and such like, it's relatively easy to identify those areas. Many of you will see these adverts appearing in the press recently, offering a long-term payment for biodiversity habitats within, within the farm. Now, to me, these two go together. If we have unproductive land, the potential for what we do, and I'm, I am no way advocating this as a, an answer because I think even though that's a very chunky number there, it's not nearly enough to take land out of production for 30 years. And let's face it, if it's in a biodiversity habitat for 30 years, it's never coming back into arable production. But the very fact this has been talked about gives us a route forward. We have growers, this is a Bulgonian Fife, our main trial site. They're putting this into action, taking a less productive areas of the farm out of production and putting cover crops or biodiverse habitats into it. And we are now speaking to the Pexicos of this world and other end users who Greenwash, I know it's been mentioned already, there is a danger of greenwashing here, but if these organisations need to up their envi environmental profile and they're willing to pay growers uh, for some of the, this unproductive land, unproductive in an arable sense, not necessarily unproductive in a biodiversity sense, then it would be very, very foolish for us as an organisation to not get involved in that. At the moment, it's agricultural companies that are interested in this. For me, the real excitement comes when the Shells, BPs, BTs realise that there's, a, there's an option to uh, improve their environmental profile. This will be a slow burn, 
but again, it's a potential solution. And we also have end users. End users are much more engaged than at any point I have certainly known in getting involved with the environmental profile. Obviously, you know, they're under pressure for their scope to uh, emissions and they need to improve. But the likes of Enid and Stanley here have taken a much more positive view and look to engage with growers. And this is going to be an important way forward. You know, regardless of your views on yen or yen zero, anything that puts end user and primary producer together has to be a good thing. There's other things that are more difficult for us to look at, but they're certainly on the, the, uh, the agenda and they're listed there. One of the problems is these, these topics tend to be much more difficult to look at in a, a trial situation. Trials are at the heart of everything that Scottish agronomy does. Uh, a tillage trial is an absolute nightmare. Uh, you know, whereas precision farming, we can often learn more from our members. But if that means that we become a conduit for other members' uh, solutions and to spread that message well, then that is a, you know, that, that to me is a win-win situation. I was lucky enough, and there's many kind of faces in the room who were on the SOS organised uh, Denmark trip in November, and I've been to Denmark before, and I hopefully will go again, but I rarely think a trip to Denmark will ever leave as lasting impression as we had in November. That was our, our first visit. It was to Arla's headquarters. And I must admit, fresh off the plane, <coughs> a, visiting a dairy cooperative, what I know about dairy, and sorry, Peter, wherever you are in the room, I could write in a postage stamp. I thought, I'll have a nice wee sleep at the back of the room. One of the best presentations I've ever heard on the challenges that we face in sustainability. And what really struck home, that is a business that is twice the size of Scottish Agriculture PLC. And one of the first things they said is, we are not big enough to tackle this on our own. So what these cooperatives are doing is speaking to one another. They're even at the level of exchanging senior staff because they recognise that this is a bigger problem than any individual organisation and the only way we are going to come forward is uh, cooperation. Now, I'm not advocating we are necessarily at that stage, but there's an awful lot to learn because if you look at the list of uh, topics that they discussed with us as potential solutions to the sustainability issues, you know, what, what bothers me is the next time someone tells me that Scotland's world leading when it comes to the climate crisis and sustainability, we're kidding ourselves. We need to learn and we need to learn fast. So, yes, there's lots of charts, you know, telling us what's going to change. I'll tell you now, not everything here will work, but some of it will. And there's some people in this room who will have ideas that will lead to other things that will be included in that chart in years to come. We've got to be open to change and we've got to embrace change because it will bring opportunities, but it's not going to be without its challenges. And my final slide would just be to say to the SOS, you've actually got the wrong guy here speaking about sustainability. There's, there's a slight element with me, possibly a poacher turned gamekeeper, but... Uh, Nigel Davies, I don't know how many of you have heard Nigel, I would strongly recommend this booklet, it's easily available and Nigel spoke at our technical conference last year and he was absolutely brilliant. He probably gave the most solution based presentation on this subject that I've heard and uh, if you want to speak to the organ grinder rather than the monkey, Nigel's your man. Thank you.